this is a very, very important report for us. Those of us who are from this part of the world uh, know that the issue of uh, food insecurity and food crisis uh, is not a new terminology in this part of the world. We, we have lived with it, we have lived through it, uh, and we have spent uh, a whole lot of time trying to ameliorate uh, problems of uh, food crisis in all our countries uh, in this part of the world. In fact, uh, what you have now as part of this week for resilience is the formulation of the second five-year phase of the 15-year planning period of the resilience agenda. We are already through with one five-year phase, and we have, of course, uh, positives to show for it. Definitely, you'll all agree with me that issues of coordination, which has been a big problem before, has improved uh, over the last uh, six-year period of the drought resilience, uh, of the resilience agenda uh, uh, implementation. And so is information exchange and you know availability of information, the correctness of the information, ownership of the information, and so is response and issues like those. And so is also resource mobilization. And the reason why resource mobilization is much better in this uh, uh, coordinated approach to resilience uh, programming is because once you produce an information that's acceptable to everybody, then people do not doubt the needs. And therefore, it's very easy for people who have something to spare uh, to put into uh, the agenda, a resilience agenda for implementation of the program uh, to easily uh, commit to some resources, for example, as opposed to when you have different types of information sources, uh, when you have an information source that's government information source, that is declared as a government info information source, and then you have an information source from an NGO, for example, uh, one from the UN systems and various other. When we all get into tribes and we have, we have fragmented, then uh, resource mobilization becomes very difficult. And you know, agree with me that resource mobilization, both within government uh, and within the private sector in various governments, within the region, and the international community is key. Uh, to this business. As you all know, uh, is related to the implementation of IDRISI, the IGAD Drought to Disaster Resilience and Sustainability Initiative, which was an initiative uh, started in this city about eight years ago, 2011. And the initiative was about coping with our ecological circumstances, which you all, all, all of you know are getting worse by the day, it's getting hotter and hotter drier and drier in more places. And in that meeting of summit of 2011, our heads of state agreed that time has come for us now to examine our own capacities and, and move forward. In the past five years, we have been implementing the program. Uh, it's now under review process. Uh, we had already uh, living documents in place. One of the input into this review process was there are sections that are not well covered. Uh, it's here and there uh, in bits, but not came into one structure and are not really got inner focus. It's called um, Human Capital, Gender and Social Development. The IDRC program has five pillars, natural resource management, Markets and trade, livelihood support, drought risk management, knowledge management and research and coordination. Now we are adding the eighth uh, pillar, which is called social, uh, human capital, gender development. The knowledge fair of Idrisi uh, started last year. We started as a small group. Focusing on the investment in cross-border area, we really had only focused on largely focusing on uh, livelihood and rangeland management. This year, thematically diversified. Uh, we continue. Hopefully, this uh, learning event will continue and expand uh, to cover all the pillars. We 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 can see also some of things are already happening. We want to really have more pillars to come out. And this year, as an input to the uh, review process, we want to have a discussion on these thematic areas. Today, we'll be sharing knowledge. And I hope we'll also be very honest with ourselves. We'll be sharing knowledge. Let's also share 
our challenges. Because without addressing, fully understanding, and acknowledging our challenges, we cannot get a solution uh, to the problems that we are going to discuss. And you are here today, not just representing your countries, but you are actually representing that poor woman, that poor child, who is malnourished, who is going hungry, who is going without water. And it's for that reason that uh, I call upon all of us uh, uh, to uh, deliberate and raise issues regardless uh, as governments we have protocols. Uh, we protect the images of our countries. <laughs> but who's going to protect the image of that child? That child, that poor woman, no, nobody. And that's why uh, we just be, let's just be honest. Of, of course, we also have projects that we are implementing. And we like to be seen that we are doing the best. In that case, we are actually, of course, we'll be talking for ourselves and the projects that we implement. I'm Dr. Kathia Dominic Lokeris. I am uh, the host of Cafe Number Two and it's on the implication of community engagement in cross-border cooperation, the core aspect of low-level dialogues. Uh, community dialogues have existed for quite a while, and uh, these dialogues have, have been actually at their local settings, which I will refer to as the home ground. While you come to cafe number two, you'll get more into this. One minute, please. Just one minute. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jesse Owino. I'm going to interest you in cafe number three on resilient prosopis. I represent a Kenya Forestry Research Institution where we convert prosopis from being an invasive species in our rangelands into livelihood changes for our pastoralists and also saving our soils at the same time improving lives for women, for children, and in cafe number three, you'll see very many interesting options. You're also welcome to test some of the things we have there. Thank you. My name is Tyvas from SweetSense. Uh, we've been working closely with NDMA and the Ministry of Water and Irrigation in Ethiopia. I'm uh, hosting cafe number seven. I want to interest you on in this because we will be showcasing how to use uh, monitoring sensors how to use technology to monitor our boreholes. So we are using these technologies, uh, remote uh, monitoring sensors, uh, to just see how uh, boreholes behave, how they function, and whenever they break down, how does that alert get to the relevant authorities and uh, quick repair for boreholes is done. So it's a part of building resilience, making sure our water systems, for the mothers that we were told this morning, are functioning year in, year out, whether there's drought or no drought. So please join me. I'll get to show you the sensors. I'll get to explain the technology, and you see how technology can be used to build resilience. Thank you. My name is Stephen Rono. I'll be hosting cafe number five, where we shall be answering question on ensuring pastoral livelihood resilience through effective participatory sub-project investment identification and safeguards. I welcome you to that uh, cafe because we shall be talking about the inno innovations that we made. There's a form that we are, we are using to secure the land, which we, we developed in our county. And then we also talk to you about the success story that we achieved in one of the counties using the safeguard tools that we, we managed to develop in the county. So please welcome so that we can share the ideas and also we can see where we can, we can learn more from there. Thank you. Okay, my name is uh, Timar Gairga uh, from Ethiopia. Uh, I'm host, uh, hosting uh, number three, uh, for the production and uh, management. Uh, this uh, fodder management is a new uh, technology uh, in pastoral area, uh, so uh, it is a, I think it is a good uh, share uh, for all of us. Thank you. I'm called James Chual from Uganda. Come to my cafe. Come. <laughs> you will see, honey, they are beekeeping as a real fact. Come. I'm begging you, come and see. Because in Uganda, 
uh, on Saturday we had a, a national exhibition of bee, uh, uh, beekeeping, management, and uh, marketing in Uganda, and I was uh, the chief guest on that exhibition. I have so a lot. Come and learn. Come. Good morning, everyone. My name is Khadija Mohammed. I'm from the IGADS Conflict Early Warning and Response Mechanism. Apparently, I'm the only female hosting one of the cafes. My cafe's name is uh, Moyale Cafe, and I will tell you about Siwon's stories in Moyale and how Siwon has contributed to the peace in Moyale. Thank you. Uh, hi. My name is Pat Rupunye. Uh, I don't know how to say come. <laughs> yeah. uh, I want you to interest you in a, a cafe, number nine, uh, that it's interesting to have a community sitting in a radius, in a circle with a radius of over 200 kilometers. And this community sits at the center. Development is beyond, from all sides, it's beyond 200 kilometers. And how targeting of such a community, how community processes, how inclusion, how uh, coordination of partners can bring uh, about change in a community that's really remote and far from support, and a community that has been uh, uh, having issues with water, walking over 20 kilometers, women uh, and, and, and school children are dropping out, out of school because of drought issues. So come. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Thank you for your very engaging advertisements. I hope you've been convinced. So what we are going to do is between now and when you start looking at the posters, we are going to put up the lists up there so that you can select your top three cafes that you want to visit, the ones that have convinced you the most. For those who don't know uh, FSIN, uh, so we are a food security information network uh, that was uh, launched by WFP, uh, if pre NFAO uh, since uh, 2011. That platform is really uh, done for uh, exchanging expertise, knowledge, evidence, best practices on food security and uh, nutrition. And we have two focus careers uh, the analysis of food crisis that uh, bring us uh, for that report, but also the resilience measurement and uh, generation of evidence. So uh, the global report on food crisis uh, comes from the discussion that were happening uh, at the World Humanitarian Summit, uh, where uh, the European Union, FAO and WFP uh, talked about uh, joint analysis and uh, take the commitment uh, to work on that fight against food crisis. Uh, they then approach FSIN to gather partnerships around uh, actors involved uh, in that type of analysis so that we could have a joint analysis uh, that is consensual uh, and uh, benchmark how we make uh, against food crisis. So uh, right now the partnership is about uh, 15 organizations, uh, donors, uh, global actors, uh, and uh, regional organizations. Uh, IGAD has been uh, part of it uh, since the beginning, uh, so uh, it's not new <laughs> uh, from, uh, from that side. Uh, the annual product really show uh, that overview and, uh, and provide the aggregate numbers so that from one year to the next, uh, we can see how we progress uh, in terms of number of people facing food crisis, but also in terms of number of countries uh, facing uh, food crisis. Indeed, we have to look at the underlying causes of food insecurity in, uh, in this region, and we name them conflict, uh, economic shocks, or, or climatic shocks. And I think in this region, we are looking at... Uh, at uh, 12, million, uh, 12 million people who are, who are basically food insecure due to, to climatic shocks, uh, 9 million due to conflict, and another 6 uh, due to economic shocks. But if we look at, uh, I, I hope you had all the time to go a little bit through the fair here, it's very encouraging to see the varieties of, of basically experience and processes that we have gone through. It's very encouraging. What is missing probably is to go to scale. 
I think at the moment we are able to respond when we have a humanitarian crisis. I've been taking two years ago the example of South Sudan, and I was talking with resource partner there when we were talking about resilience building. And uh, I was looking at the comparison between the annual investment on resilience versus the annual investment on humanitarian assistance. And we were having an investment on humanitarian assistance that in South Sudan that was constant or regular, thanks to resource partners at about 900 million, $1 billion per year. And we had a resilience investment of $1 billion as well, but over a 10 years period. So basically, that's the scale that is not right, I think, in all what we are doing, and that's what we really need to look at.